Hello and welcome back to the channel on our continuing voyage to become better blues players. My name's Mark and this week was actually a hundred years since the birth of Alva King and he was one of the most important blues players to have ever lived. And coincidentally, recently we've been looking at a few of his songs and solos in the lessons on YouTube. So this is the first time I've ever really dug into Alba King's playing and really taken a close look at it. And what surprised me was just how difficult it was. So what I'd like to do in this video is take a look at some of the specifics of his playing and talk about why we can't ever really replicate how he played, but what we can do to kind of approximate some of his playing into our own. So let's start by talking about his tuning. Now, nobody ever really knows what his tuning was, but his tuning certainly influenced the way he played. He was definitely tuned down, but there are several different opinions about what his actual tuning was. So the most common belief is that it was C, F, C, F, A, and D. That's from low to high. Um, which is the equivalent of tuning the whole guitar down a whole step and then taking the low E and A strings and then taking them down a further whole tone. That's probably the most common belief of what his tuning was, but also there were those who believed that he tuned to a minor chord like an E minor or an F minor. I also saw a suggestion that he played a particular tuning which was low to high would have been C, B, E, F sharp, B, and C. Who really knows what his tuning was? Um, personally, I think that original one, that C, F, C, F, A, and D, that was probably what he actually used, looking at some of the clips and things on YouTube, but it's a guess. And also, there's a possibility that he, he changed his tuning um, at different points as well, so who really knows? But What's really important about this is that he used nine gauge strings and he definitely tuned down somewhat. Now, why that's important is because when we do that, when we have guitar that's tuned down, we use a light gauge string, and also he was using a Gibson, which is a shorter scale length than say a Fender. When we've got all of those things combined together, it means that the strings offer very little resistance. It means that we can bend strings very easily. And because of that, it meant the strings had very little resistance, so he could bend them further and much easier. That's why bending becomes such a major part of his playing. And that's what we'll talk about next. So let's talk about his bending. So we know that he's tuned down, he's using lower gauge strings, but also importantly, he's playing a right-handed guitar left-handed, and he hasn't restrung it, meaning that the bass strings, the fatter strings are nearer the ground, and the thinner strings are further away from the ground, the opposite of what how most of the rest of the world would ever play guitar. Now this is really important because he only ever bent on the treble strings as well, but the treble strings weren't here, the treble strings were here. So where most of us, when bending a note, would push the note up like this, Albert King going here is pulling the note down. And I think that's what Eric Clapton's referring to it's going to be strange playing Albert stuff because I've never ever tried to study his playing in the way that, say, Stevie Ray did. I don't have any idea of how to play Albert because the way he played was so unorthodox and it was left-handed and he was pulling. I push and he pulls down and so I'm not sure that I'll ever really go after mastering his style. I'll probably play his songs but with my kind of guitar playing on top. So Albert King is pulling notes like this rather than pushing notes up like this, like the rest of us do. That combined with the e, with the lower gauge strings, the down tune and everything else, must have meant that there's hardly any resistance in those, uh, in those strings when he's bending them. Consequently, he can bend them a lot further and he can do more things with them. Have a look at this clip of him bending a note here. <laughs> Did you see that? He took one note, bent it up a whole tone, and then bent it up a whole tone further. Take another look. So there, he's playing in the key of G sharp, and he takes a B note, and he bends it, which is the minor third of the key that he's playing in, and he bends it up a whole tone to make it a C sharp, and then keeps pushing it until it becomes a D sharp. 
bending it up from a minor third up to a fourth and then eventually up to a fifth as well. And he does this and clearly there's very little resistance in the, uh, in the string so he can do this very, very simply. Now this type of thing occurred an awful lot in the solos, the cross cut saw and killing floor and things that we've covered in the latest lessons. So what I've done is when I've transcribed those solos, instead of putting those kind of four, four fret bends and things into, what I've done is I, I retransposed uh, where we place our fingers so that we only ever do a two fret bend. That's one of the things I had to do when trying to approximate Albert King's playing because I can't actually play the way he did because I don't retune my guitar and I don't have it strung the other way around and I'm not pulling the notes and pushing them and all those kind of things. So it was really important when I transcribed the, these solos that when we're going for the bending, I kind of just made similar sounding bends but without those incredible four note bends. Another thing I noticed when transcribing his solos was that his timing is incredibly loose. He's very comfortable coming in before or after the beat. He doesn't have to come in dead on it. He, his timing's loose, it's fluid, it flows. He's not playing in a very rigid way, trying to nail the beat every time. He clearly is very comfortable with this kind of way of playing that's very loose and around the timing. Consequently, when I came to transcribe it, what uh, if it's played exactly as it's transcribed, it won't sound exactly with his timing because his timing's more done by feel. So if you're gonna play Albert King solos, this is the thing that I found, go with the attitude. This is what I had to do. I had to try and play with the feel and the attitude that he had and not worry about counting the timing so much. We're never gonna be able to mimic his timing. His timing was unique and loose. The best we can do is try and approximate it by just playing with the same feel he did and not getting hung up if we're just coming in slightly ahead or slightly after the beat. So take a look at this clip now of Albert King playing and pay particular attention to how he's picking the notes. He's not using a pick, he's just using his thumb. He's using it in the different ways and sometimes he's really kind of snapping those notes out. So when playing his solos, I find I change the way I pick to kind of replicate what he's doing. And particularly in the lesson we did where we took four Albert King licks and built them into our own improvisation, I noticed I was changing the way I was picking and digging in and really trying to get some snap to those notes, trying to really replicate what he's doing with his thumb when sometimes he's digging in and really snapping those notes. <laughs> So as we've seen, Albert King had some really unusual traits to his playing. It's going to be impossible for us to 100% mimic or replicate exactly how he played the guitar because he played the guitar left-handed but strung right-handed. He tuned the guitar down. His bass strings were down here and his treble strings were up here. He, uh, he used nine gauge strings and he just bent notes all over the place because there was hardly any resistance in the strings when he was playing. He was pulling at notes, he wasn't pushing at them. All of these things mean that it's near impossible for us to exactly replicate his, his playing, but we can still look at his, uh, his licks and take them as an influence for, uh, to our own playing. Albert King influenced everybody from Stevie Ray Vaughan to Gary Moore. And I'm gonna leave you now with this clip from John Mayer. It would be several years later before I got my hands on a copy of the classic Born Under a Bad Sign, recorded with the legendary Booker T in the MGs. It's the perfect blues album. It sounds live, but recorded with care. It's arranged, but there's room for raw stuff that can and certainly does happen. It's a magical album, and it's as cool as a flying bee in a well-tailored suit. Albert King died a year after I started playing the guitar. He's alive in the music of the guitar players. He continues to inspire, and I know he's alive here tonight. And it's my honor and my great privilege to induct the legendary Albert King into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame.